Good morning, fifth graders, and everyone out there who's watching. Happy Monday. Um, today is Monday, May 18th, and we are back here with Read Aloud with Miss Cope. Update on the ankle. Um, ankle is still kind of swollen. Um, also a new update. My second job, I work in retail. They're opening this week, so I start working again. It's so exciting because it's starting to feel sort of like normal, even though I know we're not going to fully, completely get there very soon. But things are starting to feel a little more consistent. I'm on a routine with my new teaching, and I'm working my second job again. So yay! I hope you are all well. Um, thanks for tuning in. We're reading It Ain't So Awful Falafel by Prose Dumas. The chapter we left off on is Mount Laundry. All right, let's see what troubles Amarad gets into today. It's day four of the Pooh Brothers' invasion. <laughs> I'm at my desk doing homework. My mom comes in and dumps a huge pile of clothes on my bed. Fold these, she says, walking out of my room. None of it is ours. I start folding and putting everything in piles, shirts, pants, socks, gross, undershirts and underwear, super gross, this, their shirts still smell like them. That industrial strength cologne they use does not come out with hot water. At school the next day, I tell Carolyn about Ma Mount Laundry. You wash and fold their clothes, she asks, stunned. They're our guests, I remind her. We wouldn't do that, she answers. We have this expression in Persian. It literally means you can step on my eye. It's our way of telling our guests that we will do whatever to make them happy. So, in the Iranian culture, they go out of their way for their guests. They're stepping all over you, not just your eye, Carolyn says laughing. On Friday, the brothers ask my father if he can take them to the car dealerships on Saturday and Sunday. They are particularly interested in Camaros. My dad tells them they should get a large, solid car instead of a speedster like a Camaro. They are not listening, but my dad keeps talking. I know they're going to buy a Camaro no matter what, and their car will smell like them. At least this gives me a chance to go to Carolyn's finally. I haven't been there since the brothers arrived. Samara, my mother says, I need your help in the kitchen both days. There goes my happiness. I know that if I don't help my mom, she will stay mad for a long time. That's how she is. It's easier to do what she wants than to fight her. I never went anyway. On Saturday, I'm sitting in the kitchen, taking leaves of the stems of a huge pile of cilantro. My mom is frying onions. So what do the brothers do while we're, I'm at school, I ask. They wake up late, go to Fashion Island Mall, she says. Do you like having them here, I ask. Well, they're Mr. Shustarazi's son, she replies. Remember, that's Samara's dad's co-worker, who's also an architect. That doesn't answer my question. My mother ignores me. We're finally, we're definitely not the Brady Bunch. I spend the entire weekend in the kitchen to top off this festival of joy. I also have to fold their laundry again. Why do they have so many dirty clothes? On Monday, Carolyn says, how come you didn't call me all weekend? Don't ask, I say, but if I ever see another herb, onion, or men's underwear again, I will barf. Carolyn laughs. Next chapter. At last. The big day is finally here. The Pooh brothers are leaving. Thank God. I won't have to go to the pool with them anymore or fold their laundry. They've decided to apply to UCLA. I don't care where they go as long as I never have to see them in their bathing suits again. Before they leave, Puyan says, hey, it's Marad. Make friends with all the pretty girls, Puya adds, so you can introduce us to them in a few years, okay? Then they both laugh as if they're clever. I really can't understand these two. They thank my mom and tell her that she's cleaned their clothes better than anyone else. My mother tells them they are welcome to stay with us whenever they want. After they leave, I tell my mom that they were just saying that about the clothes because they knew they were a pain to have in our house. My mom says I should really try harder to be a nice person. And then at the way bottom of the page, it says, note to the Pooh brothers, 
that's just tear off. Please never come back. Remember, tear off is when you have to be polite to your guests, even though you really don't want them there, and they call that tear off. Next chapter, radish roses. The day after the brothers leave, my mom asked me to take a plate of pheasant decorated with radish roses next door to the Kleins. She says that the Pu that Puya and Pugan were noisy late at night for these past two weeks and the Kleins were very nice and did not complain even though we share a wall with them. I tell her that Americans would probably not like the Fezijon because it looks like mud. I don't even say anything about the radish roses, which also look muddy. My mom says that the Fezijon is one of the most delicious and erotic Iranian foods, and I should never say such a terrible thing. I should also try to be a nicer person. As soon as Mrs. Klein opens the door, I say, hello, Mrs. Klein. My mom has sent this plate of Fezijon before I can tell her that it is a pomegranate syrup. There it is pomegranate syrup in it for my country. David says, ooh, that looks like mud. I want to say, but it tastes good because it really does. And my mom would want me to say that. Instead I say, it does not taste like mud at all. David looks skeptical, but I just shrug and turn to leave. I don't think they're going to try it. Mrs. Klein says, this looks wonderful and tastes exotic. Please thank your mother for it. I will, I say. Another dish I've never heard of, Iranian dish. I'm gonna go back and see if I can pronounce it a little better. Fezajon. Some of the trimmings. <clears throat> With the Pooh brothers finally gone, I can concentrate on the most important event happening soon in America, Thanksgiving one of my favorites. According to all the magazines I have read at the supermarket, there are three things you need at Thanksgiving. A big family, true. A long table, true. And a turkey with all the trimmings, yes indeed. This is a huge problem. My mom doesn't know how to make any of the required foods. We also do not have fam a family or a long table. Our Thanksgiving so far have been just like any other meal. This year though, with a little help from El Rancho Market, I have solved the problem. We just have to order it at least two days before Thanksgiving, I explained, showing my mom the advertising flyers, and we get a complete meal already cooked. It's so easy, can we please do it? A turkey is too big for three people, she replies. According to Good Housekeeping Magazine, there are dozens of meals we can make with leftover turkey. That is true. Turkey sandwiches, yep. Turkey soup, absolutely. Turkey casserole, never tried that one. Turkey. No, <laughs> my mom cuts me off. And why would you want a meal cooked by strangers? Because I want to try turkey with the official stuff that goes with it. Persian food is better, she insists. When my dad comes home, I ask him if we can at least buy a pumpkin pie at El Rancho. How am I supposed to do well in school if I don't experience such an important part of America? I plead, making a particularly sad face. Okay, he says, let's go. My mom rolls her eyes. My dad and I drive to El Rancho and buy only, not only a pumpkin pie, but also a cranberry sauce. I knew that linking Thanksgiving with school would put him in a generous mood. Two days later, we sit at our kitchen table to eat our holiday meal. My mom has made lamb shanks with rice, dill, and lima beans. My dad grabs the can opener for the cranberry sauce. I watch him turn the handle until the lid pops off. This is our best Thanksgiving yet. He turns the can upside down, nothing comes out. And then turns it upside down again, taps it on the top, and gives it a good shape. A purple shiny tube with ridges slides out and makes a popping sound as it lands wiggling on the plate. It's like, it looks like a newborn alien. What is that? My mom asks. That's not sauce. I don't know, my dad answers, carefully touching the wobbly mask with the tip of his fingers. It does look like, doesn't look like any of the pictures in Good Housekeeping magazine. It's gone bad, my mom announces. At least we have pie. We eat our dinner quickly, like we always do. I don't have seconds because I want to leave room for a slice of America, which is what pumpkin pie really is. 
My mom brings the dessert to the table and places a slice on each of our now empty dinner plates. I taste it. It's absolutely delicious. I quickly take another bite. It's too sweet, my mom says. She puckers her face, then takes another bite. Too sweet, my dad agrees with his mouthful. A few minutes later, our plates are empty. I reach for another helping. I'll have more, too says my dad holding out his plate. Give me a small piece, my mom adds. Just a little. I give her a slice. That's too small, she says. I give her more. I serve my dad a big slice. Too sweet, they both say, digging in. I guess too sweet means more, please. We eat in silence. A few minutes later, my mom gets up to put away the dirty dishes. My dad grabs a pie, tin, Let's just finish the rest, Marad. This time we eat the pie directly out of the pan. You just have to use, get used to the flavor, he says, tilting the empty tin to slide the remaining crumbs directly into his mouth. Don't get any on the floor, my mom reminds him. It's too late for that. I go get the vacuum cleaner. It was worth every crumb. See, you always, at first, Samara's parents are like, why have an American Thanksgiving with all the turkey and all the trimmings, right? Because Iranian food is much better. But always try something new because you never know if it's going to be delicious, just like the pumpkin pie. That's why I always try things at least once. Next chapter, Uncle Babak. Babak. Christmas in Newport Beach is much fancier than in Compton, much. Everything is decorated, store windows, lamp posts, even dogs. In the evening, our street looks like a giant present with all the twinkling lights on the houses. One of our neighbors even has a life-size reindeer with a flashing red nose on the roof. Of course, there's one home with no decoration inside or out. Welcome to Dolesville, USA, otherwise known as my house. This is a very sad part of my life in America. We don't celebrate Christmas, no trees, no presents, no stockings, no gingerbread men fresh out of the oven. In third grade, I asked my mom to take me to the mall so I could ask Santa for my, an easy bake oven. I used to have one of those as a kid. My mom was in the kitchen rolling meatballs in the palms of her hands. Santa Claus is not at the mall, she says. I've seen him, I replied. He's just next to see JC Penny. That's just a guy in a costume, she says, putting the first batch in the oven. <gasps> How dare she? That's not true. He's visiting from the North Pole, but only for two weeks. Listen, Zamarad. The guy at the mall is just a man who didn't do well in school, like your uncle Babak. He's probably a smoker, and being Santa is just his job. The rest of the year, he probably asks relatives for money, like your uncle Babak. I started to cry. When you're done crying, can you help me with the cilantro? My mom asked, holding up a bunch of herbs. That was a few years ago. Now I'm used to being a part of the audience, just watching while everyone else celebrates. I don't like it, but what can I do? This year, my mom is making some kind of rice dish, no surprise there, and we're going to watch all Christmas specials on TV. I'm really excited about the Donnie and Marie Christmas show, but I still wish I had an easy bake oven. That would be nice. Yeah, it's kind of hard to celebrate a holiday, to not celebrate a holiday when everyone else around you is. Next chapter and the last one for today. January 17th, 1979. I wake up to the sound of my dad talking loudly to my mom. The news is blasting on the radio. I jump out of bed. I ask, what's happening? The Shah has left. My dad said, he's been the Shah for 38 years. Now he's left. Left for where? Egypt, forever? I don't know. Is this a revolution? They say he's left for a vacation or some kind of medical treatment. What's going to happen now? Before my dad can answer, the phone rings. It's my uncle, Karosh, from Iran. He's talking fast and loudly, but not loud enough for my mom and me to hear. My dad has a worried look on his face. I wish I knew what my uncle was saying. Remember, the Shaha is like um, the Iranian president, except they can stay for life and they're not elected by the people. I can't believe it, my dad keeps repeating. After a few minutes, he hangs up. What did he say, my mom? Asked my mom. The Shah has left, but no one knows for how long. He has appointed Shapur Bahiter to form a new government. Who's that, I ask? 
He was a well-respected fan of democracy who spent six years in prison because he opposed the Shaha. Hmm. My dad explains, and now the Shaha has appointed him. My mom asks, sounding puzzled. Bakadar does not want Iran to have a religious government. Neither does the Shaha. He's already made some important announcements. Your uncle Kurosh says that Pakhtar is ordering all political prisoners to be freed is stopping censorship of newspaper and is getting rid of the Savak. Thank God. He sounds like a good guy, my mom says. You want to hear something interesting about him? When he was young, he fought with the Spanish against Franco and with the French against Nazi Germany. Whoa, a Nazi fighter, I say? Yes, my father answers. Now let's see what he can do for this mess. He has asked everyone to give him three months to hold elections for an assembly that will determine the future government of Iran. But what does that mean, I ask? Just get ready for school and we'll talk later. You're going to be late. I hate that. I have to go to school today. I put on my clothes, brush my teeth, grab my backpack. I'm not hungry for breakfast. When I go downstairs, I see my parents are now watching TV. There is a special news report about Iran that is interrupting the regular program. Bakhtar is mentioned briefly, but the news keeps showing people burning effigies of the Shaha and chanting Ayatollah Khomeini. I've never heard of Khomeini, but he is suddenly like a rock star at the huge concert, except there's no music, there are no t-shirts to buy, and there are no answers to our questions. I have a math test today. I am so anxious, not about the test, but about my whole life. What is going to happen to us? What is going to happen to Iran? As I walk past the football field, I see the cheerleaders working on a routine to Boogie Oogie Oogie. That's one of these songs that stick in your head all day. It's an ordinary Wednesday, just another sunny day in California. I'm pretty sure that none of the cheerleaders are thinking about the Shah. They're so lucky to have such easy lives. All right, we'll stop it there. Thank you all for watching. Um, I will see you tomorrow to find out what happens next. Have a wonderful Monday. Toodles.